Good day. Welcome today to today's live event. We are going to be working with uh, Chef Jackie Pfeiffer again in part two of our six-part series on the cake baking and decorating arts course that we've launched a month ago. Today we're going to be focusing on sponge cakes and variations on hot and cold process sponge cakes, uh, tricks of the trade. Uh, Chef Jackie will discuss, var discuss variations with incorporating chocolate, uh, toasted nuts, and other options. We're going to go through five of the different recipes that are hosted on our cake uh, baking and decorating course. Uh, this course itself is approximately 70 hours long and approximately 70 recipes. Um, this is our third of uh, courses that we've developed with the French Pastry School. So today we're going to just dive in and uh, you can ask your questions on the right hand side. If you've never been to the one of our live events, you enter a question on the right hand side and we'll get to the Q&A in about a half an hour after we've gone through some of the content on sponge cake. So like I said, this is part two of a six part series. Um, next year, we're going to go into uh, buttercreams and fillings. Uh, we're going to talk about piping, uh, different types of frostings, uh, and then we'll get into hacks um, from the chef. Uh, so stay tuned for part three through six in the new year. Um, I'd like to introduce my uh, friend, Chef Jackie Pfeiffer, who's broadcasting here from Chicago. And uh, we're going to dive into the first uh, topic, which is going to be a hot process uh, chocolate Genoa sponge cake. But first, Chef Jackie, uh, I'd like you to tell a little story about yourself and uh, how you've come to uh, be where you are in uh, Chicago with the French Pastry School. Well, it's a long story. I'm not sure if it's that exciting, uh, but thanks for uh, the introduction. Uh, I've um, been baking for a long time, uh, 45 years, uh, and uh, I traveled all over the world uh, baking uh, in different establishments, and I finally landed in beautiful Chicago in 1991, and uh, uh, we were operating... Um, a brick and mortar school, the French pastry school. And uh, when we met with uh, the Ruby folks, we decided to transfer this um, knowledge into an online component that anyone can uh, have access to uh, worldwide and in the comfort of their home. So as you mentioned, uh, we have uh, created three courses. The first one is the introduction to pastry arts course the second one is uh, the bread baking arts course. And the third one that we just launched is the cake baking and decorating arts course. And uh, so different topics for different courses, um, but uh, they, all, uh, they all pretty much follow the same uh, path where we talk about food science. We, we explain why the recipes work and don't work. We help the students to... Uh, understand the core of the recipe which is um which is the most important because once you really understand and master a recipe then you can you can play with it and add your own twist but before that you need to you need to learn how to walk before you can run right that's the expression so this um for this live event we're going to talk about sponges and we picked uh, together with, with Chef Scott, we picked five different sponges. They have different techniques. And um, we'll, uh, we'll talk about why, why uh, this sponge is made like this, why another one is made like that, and how can you interchange them, and so on. So, um, Scott, if you want to get yeah, going Chef, with I, the first I recipe. I need to ask a, a question before we get going. Um, what is a sponge cake? What is a sponge cake? Yeah. Why is it why okay. is it called a sponge cake? Um, what's the difference between you other cakes? Yeah. A sponge That's cake is a from. is a, a form created usually by with um, eggs, whole eggs, uh, uh, and those eggs can be mixed whole or they can sep they can be separated and whisked separately, okay, into a form. And usually sugar is added to this egg, uh, egg yolk or egg white uh, to stabilize this form. And once those forms are created, then we need to add some solids. Otherwise, this form would never solidify. Okay. And the solid usually is uh, in, comes in the form of uh, flour, 
could be cake flour, could be pastry flour, all-purpose flour, definitely not bread flour because it just contains too much gluten. And uh, some recipes actually uh, use some cornstarch, a small amount of cornstarch, potato starch, baking powder. And um, at the end of the mixing, we add some melted butter uh, for uh, a very nice and rich flavor. So in a nutshell, this is uh, what a sponge is. Excellent. So uh, let's get into the, the first uh, recipe. Um, so this is from Unit 5 uh, Sponge Cakes in the Cake Decorating Program. And let's talk about hot process uh, chocolate genoise. I think, uh, Patrick, let's roll the video first, and then we can discuss uh, what we saw and the details. So what is a what is a hot process uh, sponge cake, chef? Well, a hot process sponge cake is a is a cake where uh, the eggs and the sugar are whipped into a foam. But uh, to stabilize the, this uh, uh, foam, <laughs> we warm it up a little bit over a, a double boiler, and this also called a bamery. And uh, what this does, and, and we bring it to about 122 Fahrenheit or 50 Celsius. And what this does, it coagulates slightly the eggs. And, and once an egg is slightly co coagulated, uh, it will, it will uh, be more stable. Because the next step after the warming up is the cooling down. And so we, we transfer the, the mixture in, <coughs> sorry, in, onto a, a stand mixer and we whip it until it's cold. Uh, when I say cold, it's uh, about 93 to 95 Fahrenheit, 34, 35 Celsius. And then we fold in the flour, okay? And in this case, we fold in flour plus cocoa powder, okay? Um, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to incorporate also some butter. And we um, recommend using clarified butter. Clarified butter is the butter where the solids were removed. And um, you're gonna ask me, why, why can't I use melted butter? You can, but <laughs> those solids are going to make the butter sink to the bottom of the bowl when we fold it, okay? And um, so I always recommend clarified butter and the butter has to be cooled, uh, first melted, and then cool to about uh, 105 Fahrenheit or 40 Celsius, okay? So there's a lot of temperatures going on, right? The first temperature is to coagulate the eggs. Then, then we whip the mixture, the eggs and sugar until cold, okay? But, and then we add it to a clarified butter that is at a certain temperature, 105 Fahrenheit. So the reason why those, those temperatures are there is because if you add the butter when it's too hot, the butter is going to sink to the bottom of the mixing bowl, okay? And then uh, you're going to realize it, and then you're going to continue to stir to make sure it's incorporated, and then uh, the sponge is going to deflate. On the other hand, if your uh, uh, clarified butter is too cold, as soon as it will, it will be mixed with the mixture, it will crystallize, but on its own. That means you can have patches of fat in your sponge, okay? So it seems super complicated, but it's just a few temperatures to uh, watch, watch out for, and then you should be fine, okay? So I made a, a sample of a sponge cake uh, for you because uh, one thing we did not mention is that the flour and the cocoa powder always have to be sifted, yeah? So I did, I did a sponge cake here and I did not sift the flour. And then, uh, Jeff, I hope you can see this. Um, uh, 
where you see small pieces of flower in there. Can you see those, Carl? So that is, that's, huh? That's what's happening when, uh, when uh, you do not sift the flour, okay? And then I did something else, something very bad, but I overmixed the butter. The one on this side right here is properly mixed. This one is overmixed. So this is the same sponge mix mixture, but you can see the, the difference of height, yeah? And this one, this one stayed nice and flat while, while the overmixed one is creating kind of like a dome. So this is why, this is why when you fold in the, um, the dry uh, elements in your form, you gotta be very, very careful, okay? Uh, how are we how are we careful is that we first mix have some props here we first mix with a whisk okay very important you're gonna ask me why 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 was a uh, whisk first chef Scott right well, you're not gonna I'm gonna let you keep talking but the, my question before you go on is when you say you overmixed it I assume that you built up the gluten too much and that's why it kite Kind of tightened up into a dome is that right yes i over over uh i uh, activated the gluten but i also killed deflated that foam and uh and now the the sponge is just like a, a big uh, blob of uh over mixed uh, uh sponge so right. something that i want i want to tell you about is that this is the mixer that i use for um the mixing bowl that I use to make my sponge that goes in, in my stand mixer. But then what we recommend is that you pour it into a bowl. Could be a bowl like this if it's a large size, right? And the reason why we do that is because it is, it is not convenient to fold in flour like this. Yeah? You see, this is not... Uh, uh, the flour would sink right in this in this pot right here. And uh, if you pour it in here, you're much more comfortable. This is a nice round bowl. And uh, like, like I said, we start, we start with a whisk because a whisk is much more efficient than a spatula. A whisk is like a spatula times 20. You see all those, all those wires. So in the beginning, we start with a whisk. whisk. We fold in the flour first. And then after that, towards the end, we finish it with a spatula. And the equipment is also very important, uh, uh, Chef Scott, because this is the right size spatula for this size sponge. If, if I have this Mickey Mouse spatula here, um, uh, it will work, but since it's not as big, it will force me to fold this mixture longer. And uh, in the process, I would deflate, deflate it. Okay, so the size of the equipment, that type of equipment is very important. So to get back to the video that we saw, yes, we saw the sifting of the flour and the cocoa first, and then we mixed the eggs and had them up to about 122 degrees. And when you say that we begin to uh, fold in the flour, you're using the whisk for the beginning of that, and then you transfer and start using the larger spatula so that you smooth it out and that you're not um, over mixing it but you at least started it with the whisk, right? Yes. And, and also a trick, a trick is uh, usually, usually we don't add the, the melted uh, clarified butter straight in the form. We put the clarified butter, let's say in this smaller bowl, and we add a little bit of the sponge mixture in there and we mix mm -hmm. this just so the, the butter is already half mixed with the foam. You see, it will incorporate okay. much better than if you put the clarified butter straight in the in the mixture with the flour and everything. Okay. Okay. So a little bit of uh, of sponge mixture with the clarified butter uh, is is a is a very very good trick. Okay. And for everyone watching right now, this is uh, on the course in detail with the recipe, the temperature, the mixing. Yes. 
And uh, for those of you that don't know, the clarified butter is butter that's been heated up so that the milk solids are separated. Um, and if you keep cooking it, you would make brown butter by cooking the milk solids and also the salts rise to the surface. So what you're left is a, a pure fat, which is better to use for your sponge cakes, right, Chef? Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, you know, you're the chef, right? Um, not, but not uh, chef. absolutely, you're 100% right. And, and uh, you know, some people uh, will say, oh, can I use oil? So oil will definitely work too. It's much cheaper. It will, it will bring a lot of moisture to the sponge, but it will never taste like butter. Okay, so right. and then you can um, you can also use a, a butter alternative uh, uh, that um, that uh, will work for this recipe. Okay, so that's not a problem. Um, I think we covered it all for this recipe. Oh, uh, something I wanted to say. This is a an example of a hot process sponge. Okay, but it, that hot process sponge does not have to be just for chocolate. You can make any sponge that you want that follows the same type of starting with the eggs and sugar uh, and then add the flour and then the butter. You can do that with regular sponge, nut sponge, chocolate sponge. So it, that, that hot process is not specific to chocolate sponges. Okay. I just want to make sure people uh, understand that. And the other way around, uh, a cold process sponge can also be switched to a hot process sponge. Okay, so before we move on to the cold process, what, what type of oven is best? A convec convection or conventional oven for making the sponge? It's, a, it's really either or, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, works, it works well either or. Uh, I, uh, I, do, I don't see any problems. You just have to make sure that you have enough heat in the oven, uh, we recommend 350 Fahrenheit, but you know, so, uh, some ovens have a mind on their own. Uh, and, um, and 350 uh, might be 325 in your oven because it has a weaker output. And so you might have to increase it because if you don't have enough heat, the, the bubbles in the, that you have created in the form are not gonna expand at the rate that you want to. They're going to expand a little bit, but not enough. And your sponge is going to be tough uh, because it's not as airy as, as you want to. And also the water in the mixer, there's a lot of water in, in eggs. And uh, that water uh, wants to evaporate and will also lift the cake. So this can only happen with enough heat in your oven. So we recommend 350. But if you make a sponge and you see you, if in, you bake it in your oven, it does not really rise up the way you want to, then you, you, would, you should calibrate your oven or put a thermometer in there or give it a, an extra 20 degree just to uh, teach him a lesson, you know? Thank you, Chef. Uh, let's move on to cold process. And before we uh, take a look at the video, what, what do you want to say about cold process as a major difference, obviously, temperature with the hot process? Well, the, the cold process is um, it's exactly the same way as the hot process, except obviously we're, we're, not heating the, we're not heating the ingredients of our memory. We're just putting the eggs and sugar in the, in the mixing bowl right away, and we start whipping it. Got to make sure those eggs are at room temperature. That's a very common mistake. People crack the eggs straight from the refrigerator, and they think that by magic, they just came to room temperature. It does not work like this. If you put your, your if, if you touch the bowl and you feel that the mixture is cold, then what you should do, you should put it over like some hot water and just warm it up a little bit because warm, slightly warm eggs, not warm, but room temperature eggs, they will form much better than cold eggs, okay? Because the eggs, the egg yolk part contains 30% fat, and that fat will will be will will be emulsified much better if it's at room temperature than if it's stone cold. So I have a little uh, trick that I do. If I want my eggs to be room temperature right out of the fridge, I put them in a bowl and cover them with hot water, and in about 10 minutes, it's kind of equalized, so I don't have to like think about it ahead of time. Good, very smart. Uh, one thing 
you should never do and i always get this question can i can i put the eggs in a microwave for a few seconds uh to warm them up uh no unless you want to make okay. scramble uh, sponge cake which which gonna be a uh, a new one right for you but um right. do not do not use the microwave to warm up the eggs okay it, they, they will always overheat okay just uh, like you said just put it uh, put a little bit of hot water from the sink put the bowl over it and and then uh cover it just stir after that after five five ten minutes and then you're done okay okay let's uh let's take a look at the cold process video okay So part of that video showed that ex uh, that process of using the whisk in the beginning. You wouldn't use the whisk the whole time because you'd overmix it, but at least to get the flour incorporated into your foam in the beginning. Um, the cold process. There Absolutely. Was no Absolutely. If you use the whisk for the whole process, it's it's actually too efficient, and um, and you will you will overmix the butter. Okay, that that means it will be much tougher. So whisk first and spatula second. Okay. And is there anything we should know about the temperature of the clarified butter? Is it different from uh, the hot process? It's, or it's, 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 it's the same. It's the same. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the trick is the same. Uh, what something we did not uh, talk about before is that all these sponges that we are going to show uh, uh, can be uh, baked into a small sheet pan. I have one here. Here we go, like a small cheat pan like this or like that. Uh, and you would use 600 grams of butter for those half sheet pans, okay? And uh, this way you can make a jelly roll, okay? And um, the reason why I have those props here is because imagine you have sponge cake on here, right? Obviously you put a piece of paper, uh, 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 parchment paper first, sponge cake, and then you can sprinkle some uh, some things here. I have some cocoa nibs uh, from guitar. Those are cocoa nibs are the, the shell of the, the actual cocoa bean that are crushed. They give a very nice um, chocolate flavor and a crunch, okay? And uh, the reason why I have uh, cocoa powder here is because uh, you can always take a white sponge and change it into chocolate by adding, uh, by uh, changing 10% of the flour into cocoa powder. Okay, that's that's something to know as well. Um, so, Chef Scott, as you know, we did a small competition. Uh, each one of us did a, a sponge cake, and then I want to show it to you. So, this is my sponge cake that I did, and then this is yours. So, you still have to. Uh, work on your folding skills obviously you over mixed it slightly the good news is both of us um sifted the flour that's the good news the the bad news you just you're just a little too energetic when you when you fold the flour okay uh thanks yeah don't worry you know you'll you'll, you'll get it so something else i want to say if if um if uh, you make a sponge, uh, it could be a jelly roll sponge or a sponge like this, and you overbake it, a trick, that's a $50 trick right there, you, uh, you put that sponge uh, covered in plastic wrap in the refrigerator, or, or actually uncovered, uncovered in the refrigerator overnight. And refrigerators are extremely humid. Some of them are about 80, 90% humidity. They, they do that so the food in your fridge does not dry out. And so that's a trick. Uh, uh, an overbaked sponge slightly, not, not so much burned, but dry. You put it in the fridge overnight, and the next day it will be much moisture. Nice. 
So I know you wanted to talk about nut powders. If I wanted to incorporate a almond powder uh, or flour into uh, my sponge, how would I do that? Well, the, the rule of thumb is, uh, uh, let's say for 100 grams, uh, if you have a 100 gram of flour in your recipe, uh, uh, you could uh, take half of this, okay? So you take 50 grams of the, of the flour away from the recipe and you mm -hmm. replace it with 100 gram of, of uh, nut flour. So two, two parts of nut flour to replace one part of uh, okay. wheat flour. Okay, that's the rule of thumb. Uh, uh, you can also just keep the sponge the way it is and then sprinkle some chopped nuts uh, in, um, in it. Uh, that works too. Make sure they're small, so otherwise they'll, they'll sink. Uh, mm -hmm. But but that's the trick to do it, and any kind of nut flour will work. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's move on um, to the white cake, um, and let's uh, let's take a look yes. at the video, and then you can talk about the the white cake and how it's different from the other two we've talked about. Okay. All right, I love that video. I love the, the baking visual. So tell me, is, is a white cake, uh, this recipe, is this a sponge cake or is this completely different? Everything is a sponge cake. <laughs> uh, 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 but but uh, the method, this method is really like uh, mind boggling, if you, if you will, uh, compared to a regular sponge cake, which is also called uh, a genoise, okay? And, um, uh, uh, Everything is, is on its head because uh, we, uh, we mix all the liquid ingredients in one bowl and we put all the dry ingredients in another bowl. Uh, the liquid ingredient, the milk, is, is warmed up a little bit to make sure that the liquid mixture is not cold. Okay, that's, that's the trick. And then after that, we pour the liquid over the... Over the the dry ingredient, okay? And um, what makes this so interesting is, is that it contains, it, it, there's no forming part of it, right, at all. You start with the flour. Usually flowers always goes at the end because we are afraid to, um, to uh, over mix the gluten. But this recipe has so much liquid, the gluten just doesn't, doesn't stand much of a chance. And, and then when you bake it, the sponge, the sponge is not much in the pan, but then it just, it just uh, develops very nicely in the oven because of the uh, baking powder. So it's a fair amount of baking powder. Like in the first, in the first two recipes, we had no baking powder. Okay, so it's a completely different um, recipe. Is it better? Is not better? Uh, our goal in our courses is to show the students a wide range of ways to do things. And then after that, everybody can just pick and choose their own technique, whatever works best for them. Uh, we started with the most difficult one, which is the not difficult, but labor intensive. We have to warm up the eggs and then form, form them after that and add the flour. The second method is a little easier, but we still have to wait for that form to happen. Now this is definitely the one that is uh, the, the most uh, production friendly is because you just put the liquids with the liquids, the dries with the dry, and then you just mix them together. And I know a lot of cake makers, cake de decorators use this because 
they are so busy in production they they um they don't have time to to do all this forming and and, and temperature uh, control and all this so but at the end you know uh there's no right right or wrong answer okay so i did notice in the video where we're adding the butter to the flour and mixing it and i assume that it's important that it's a cake flour which has a low protein content so when you're doing that process you're not building up gluten too much is that right yes absolutely absolutely uh you 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 saw right again right well i was taught well well <laughs> let's move on to your next recipe chef this is a, a chocolate cake um and this is a still in our sponge cake unit within the cake baking and decorating arts course we do present the hot yes. process the cold process uh, and then this white cake is called the american style cake uh, and then let's show you two yes. more we have the chocolate cake and then we'll go into the velvet cake so Let's uh, yeah. roll the chocolate cake back. Excellent. So what makes this chocolate cake uh, technique different than uh, the white cake that we just saw? Well, if you if you uh, uh, if you look at the video, it, it says it all. It, it's it's yet another way of making a sponge cake. This is what I love about baking is you you can have those those fundamental ingredients and then just turn them all kinds of different ways and end up with a sponge right uh so there's uh we say always there's many different ways to to uh, not all uh, all roads lead to rome something like this right uh, uh so ev every technique is different but at the end we end up with a sponge cake so what makes this so interesting is that you mix the oil with the butter first uh, melted okay and then you add ice cold water to it okay only ice cold water will make oil solidify into uh, an emulsion okay uh, uh, often often when we teach this class uh, uh, students they don't want to bother using ice cold water and they're like oh it doesn't work for me that expression doesn't exist <laughs> doesn't work for me it it works for the butter and the oil, right? If the the water is ice cold that was maybe pre-scaled and left in the refrigerator, or you put a couple ice cubes in there, it will make uh, an emulsion, okay? So that's what's so interesting. Um, we do the emulsion first, and then after that, we add the rest of the ingredients, the dries and then the liquid. Again, completely different way of doing things. And uh, and yet it's it's a great sponge, and in a, in this sponge we're also adding sour cream. Sour cream always adds a great uh, tangy taste. It uh, adds moisture, but also it lowers the pH of the um, of the recipe of the recipe, and uh, and that what what it will do it will allow the the cocoa powder to keep its vibrant color. Okay, and um, so you will will see the same technique done in uh, for the next one, the, the red velvet cake, where acid is added to the mixture to make sure that the color that we want, the end color, is vibrant. Here it's going to be a vibrant brown reddish. Okay, so uh, very interesting way of of doing this. You could uh, replace. Uh, the sour cream with um, maybe a creme fraiche or yogurt, things like this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it will work out, uh, uh, but but it makes a very very moist sponge. And you're going to tell me why? Can I use can I use melted chocolate? 
you can definitely use melted chocolate instead of cocoa powder because melted chocolate is contains uh, a sugar, but it contains also at least 32% of cocoa butter, which is going to get nice and moist. Okay. And mm -hmm. so it's much going to, you're going to end up with a much creamier finish than if you use cocoa powder. Cocoa powder is 100% cocoa solid. That is the, really the end process of making chocolate. So this has zero, zero percent uh, um, sugar. It's very dry and usually we use it only for sponges. So lots of options there again. Mm -hmm. So a question about one, uh, one aspect of the video. When we saw the, the white emulsion on the whisk, that was the emulsion of the butter, oil, and ice cold water, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Absolutely, right, the, beginning, to... the beginning of the video. Yes. All right, so let's move on to uh, the last recipe before we start doing uh, taking questions. Uh, the velvet cake. Um, anything you want to say about this, Chef, before we uh, roll it? No, I'll let you roll it first, and then I'll figure out something to say. Okay. Excellent. So how do we get the bright red color? <laughs> Food coloring. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, what I want to say about this sponge cake is that it mimics the, the white cake uh, pros process, but there's, there's much more things going on. So it has red food coloring, but also cocoa powder. Okay. And um, so there's an addition of buttermilk in this recipe and also vinegar. <laughs> this is added in the, in the recipe. So we lower the pH again uh, in our recipe. Okay. And uh, the pH, the, the, that acid is, is going to capture the, the reddish, brownish color of the cocoa powder, but also is going gonna, is gonna to keep the red color intact. Okay. I don't know if you ever made recipes, uh, Chef Scott, with uh, red color, or even with raspberries, and they turn blue. The um, muffin can turn blue. All you would have to do is add some lemon juice in this butter before you bake it, and you will see that it actually stays red. <clears throat> so uh, acid, acid does this. It lowers the pH of a mixture and uh, helps capture the uh, color. But the acid is also in there for another reason. It's in there because we have baking soda in the, in the mixture, in the red velvet recipe, and that baking soda and acid are going to interfere. They, they're going to uh, uh, combine, and it creates a foam. It, preempt, it, it will bubble up and force the, the, the cake to rise due to the creation of carbon dioxide. That's fun. A lot of science in this cake to make it red and the right texture. Right. So, chef but at the end, you know, it's 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 just things to remember. It's all, as you mentioned, it's all explained in the in the in the recipes, and and it's just some things to remember. And then after a while, after a while, everything makes sense. Uh, right. Uh, if you know what does what, the acid does does affects the, uh, creates foam uh, through the, the baking soda and captures the color. All those, all those um, uh, reactions are always the same for every recipe. So, so you can then after that uh, uh, put the pieces of the puzzle together and realize that everything is interconnected in, in baking. In, in, in cooking too, it's the same, it's same idea. Excellent. So in terms of uh, baking pans, you know, you talked about making a jelly roll by, by doing it on a half sheet pan. And then I've seen that the other two you baked in a round pan. I assume that all these cakes can be baked in different size pans based on what we might want to make, be it a, a bush de Noel and using a jelly roll or a stacked cake. It just depends on the temperature and the time. 
based on how thick the batter yes. is. Is that, is that right? Yes. And yeah, and if you use a, a pan that is made out of steel, uh, that's the best option because steel conducts the heat the best in baking. Um, then the second best choice is some kind of metal, usually that has aluminum. And then after that, you have a ceramic nine inch pans or glass uh, uh, or silicone. And those don't conduct the heat as good. So what I do at home when I bake uh, and, and I just have whatever or, or at home or at friend, friends, let's say, and they're like, oh, can you make a sponge cake? And then whatever pan they have, I adjust the heat in, in the oven. If I see the, the pan is a ceramic pan or a glass pan, I increase the oven by, by 20 degrees. Uh, okay. Otherwise, I will not get enough of a reaction. If I, if I have a steel pan, then I know the temperature is fine. Okay, So it's all about uh, working around the um, equipment that you have. And uh, sometimes uh, a convection oven has a very, very harsh fan. And mm -hmm. so you could sometimes reduce that heat a little bit if needed. And a conventional oven can be weak and, and you, you might have to increase it. And, and usually I always bake things right in the middle of the oven. Uh, so, so I have the best chances to, uh, to get the proper result. Okay. So going through these in terms of equipment, I would say uh, a mixer for the whisking, um, a nice wide uh, rubber spatula, a whisk, a large bowl, um, the proper recipes. And then uh, I'd say a thermometer for te testing uh, the temperature of the eggs with the Genois. Yes. Right. And then yes. uh, I would say an oven thermometer to make sure that you're at 350, depending on the, the type of oven that you have. And and you just need to buy them once. And then uh, if you if you care for your equipment, you, you can have it for 20 years. It's not a problem. You just have to care for it. Um, same for, for a thermometer. Most, actually, most thermometers, you should never submerge them in water. There's no reason to submerge in water. I know you wash yours in the dishwasher. You should not do that, Jeff Scott. But I know it's a habit, right? But no. uh, uh, just if you care for your equipment, uh, there, there will not be a problem for many, many years, OK? All right, Chef, looks like we have a, a good list of questions here. Let's let's dive in. And uh, the first question is okay. plant-based. Uh, hello, is this sponge cake recipe plant-based? Well, um, as, as we have butter and eggs in it, um, it, it is not plant-based. And uh, do you have any method for making plant-based? Or should we uh, refer um, Hind to uh, Chef Fran, who does our um, essential yeah. vegan desserts? You, you, it, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it's, it's best to, to uh, because if you don't want to put eggs in there, then, then you really are, uh, are changing the recipe around. And uh, I don't want to make up stuff. And so the best is to refer this person to Chef Fran, who has a, a countless recipe of, of, uh, of, of vegan uh, sponge cakes. Okay. All right, next question is from Aldo. Um, thanks for joining, Aldo. And uh, cheers, Chef. Can I use one of the sponge cakes to make uh, tres leches? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I would use the the cold process uh, vanilla sponge cake that works really well. Uh, it's very uh, sturdy uh, because uh, tres leche is usually soaked in uh, three different uh, milks. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, that, that sponge should be able to withstand the, all of this moisture. Uh, if not, then, then you take the, the white, the, the vanilla sponge cake cold process, but you turn it into a hot process. And, and that will give you even more stability, okay? Okay, excellent. So this next question is from Carolyn. Thanks for joining, Carolyn. Uh, are there times when you would uh, use one type of sponge, the hot or cold process, over the other? You know, what determines which one you're going to use? It's really up to you. And that's why we, um, up to you and actually up to your guests because uh, or, or your customers, your customers might might say, oh, I really like this sponge, I really like that sponge. And maybe that's not your preferred sponge, but at the end, the customer will always dictate 
uh, what they prefer, right? And uh, you can always make those sponges moisture, moisture by adding uh, a little bit more clarified butter or adding some oil, uh, adding uh, applesauce, adding a little sour cream. There's many different ways for you to, if, if this is what you want. I think they find a way they are, but, you know, and, and also in cake decorating, you don't want to make those sponges so delicate because I uh, imagine if you have a five or seven tier cake and the sponge is like barely holding together. So, but just just uh, mentioning uh, tricks of the trades to um, to make a sponge uh, more um, more moist. Okay. All right. So the next question is coming from Leslie, and uh, it says, "Hi, chefs. What are some recipes that use only egg yolks or only egg whites?" With the uh, reference to sponges first, I assume you're using whole eggs all the time with sponge cakes. Is that right? Yes. Yes. We use whole eggs, but for instance, a recipe of lady lady finger, typical recipe is you you whip the egg yolk with sugar in one bowl, and you whip the egg white and sugar in another bowl, and then you fold them together and add the flour. What whipping egg white separately will add much more uh, uh, air in your sponge, okay? And those sponges are uh, usually used for little things like uh, lady fingers. Those are little little guys, right, that you pipe on a sheet pan and you, and you bake. Uh, usually those sponges are not made for uh, cakes, uh, like, like for celebration cake, because they're just a little fragile, okay? So um, I hope this answered the question. Uh, something that I forgot to mention in... Um, in the beginning is that in the old days, long, long time ago, uh, when I started to bake, a chef told me that uh, if, you, if you don't have a recipe with you, a sponge cake recipe, just remember one egg, one egg is usually 50 grams, by the way, one egg, 35 grams of sugar and 30 grams of um, flour. Okay, if you remember that, then you should be able to make a sponge cake uh, without much of a recipe. Okay. Nice. So I'm going to um, elaborate a little bit, Leslie, on your question um, because you yeah, asked, so are there some recipes that use only egg yolks or egg whites? Uh, what comes to the top of mind would be ice cream using egg yolks um, and then a, a meringue or a angel food cake using the egg whites. So there are recipes that will just use egg yolks or egg whites. But I kind of want to uh, tie yes. that to the, the sponge cake topic here. And and also there is some other sponge sponge cakes that uh, they have different names. The French love to give names to different things. And uh, they're called daquas, for instance, where it's just egg white and nut powder and a little bit of, of wheat flour. So this one does not contain any egg yolk at all. But... Again, usually they are baked uh, thinly or uh, as a jelly roll or uh, as a little guy, uh, indiv individual sponge cake for, uh, for smaller pieces, right? Um, so there is daquas, there is this, a few of them, uh, a Japanese, another one, and, and they can be baked just a little bit so they stay nice and moist or they can be baked longer so they're like, actually slightly crunchy which is borderline a meringue now which right. which uh is is baked until it's hard okay all right chef uh, next question comes from sheila thanks for joining sheila uh, is there a special spatula that works better than others to fold in be beaten egg whites and i know that you spoke about only, the larger spatula anything special only otherwise? my spatula only my spatula works you know nobody else's spatula works now you can use any spatula. Uh, you can use any spatula. This one is rubber, but you can use a wooden spatula. Uh, it just has to be wide enough here, yeah. For uh, for uh, and because we're talking about uh, uh, this mixture, this mixture is made of ten eggs. So this is this is the right thing. If if you use a half half recipe, this one might might do it. Okay. Now you're gonna okay. you're gonna be horrified, but that's okay. But 
uh, uh, in production, uh, what happens is when we have a big bowl, uh, we're talking, uh, you know, you can can sit in that big mixing bowl. We don't use spatulas because they um, they would not reach all the way down. So we put one of those gloves that the, the veterinarians use, right? And then we just go like this, yeah? And we open our fingers like this. So, so we actually mimic the whisk, right? And then, and then we go all, and, and with our fingers, we can reach all the way down to the mixing bowl and our senses will tell us if there's flour hidden down there. Because I, I want to make sure people understand that when you fold, you have to scrape the bo bottom of that bowl at every fold. A lot of people are just folding on the surface. I've seen you do this, Chef Scott. Folding on the surface like this or just folding like this on uh, around the block. The flower will go in one place and one place only. It's right here on the bottom because of gravity. It's, it's heavier than the foam. So you got to scrape. This one you turn it, this one you scrape it. You pretty much become a human mixer. Yeah? Okay. So, but you don't need, you don't need uh, like a special spatula that is like magical, okay? Any spatula will work. All right, Sheila, I hope that answers your question. Um, Carolyn, uh, another question here. When stacking cakes, should you always use a sponge cake or can you also use a, a butter cake? Can you repeat, sorry? Yeah, when stacking cakes, um, she's referencing, oh. should you always use a yes. sponge cake or can you also use um, a butter cake? Yeah, good question. Uh, <clears throat> often when cakes are stacked, uh, we're talking about pretty pretty tall. You have two choices, or you have some kind of a frame that is made out of metal with with platters that interlock and hold on a central uh, pillar, and those those metal plates are just held by it's a system. It just they don't they're not going to sink on top top of each other. And for there, if you have a system like this, uh, a cake a cake stand, it's called then you can just use a regular sponge. But if you are planning on stacking a cake, just separate it with a cake um, uh, cardboard, um, then uh, you have to put pillars, uh, little wooden dowels that you cut to the right size. And then yes, uh, I would advise to use a cake that is a little sturdier, that is a butter cake, okay? And this butter cake usually has a little bit more butter, has a little bit more sugar and a little bit more flour. It's a little sturdier. It's like in between um, a sponge cake and a pound cake. Okay, it's in between. Thank you. So uh, next question is coming from Maria. Hi chefs, I love your program. I've just finished the build a buttercream cake assignment and I'm looking forward to the next lessons. How do I keep the edges of my sponges from browning or drying out? That's a good question. The, the oh the the side of the sponge yeah so you have the brown edges and dried out and uh she's concerned if oh there very good question uh yeah very good question uh in the winter often like here in chicago we see it it's very drastic when it's cold obviously the humidity in the air is um dried out okay uh, and uh, we go in the summer, it's about 120% humidity. It's just so humid. Nothing dries out. In the winter, as soon as we bake something and we're afraid to dry it out, we cover those, uh, those uh, items. And uh, I did that with the sponge cake yesterday when I made it. Uh, I baked it, uh, let it cool on the wire rack a little bit uh, for about 10 minutes and then I wrapped it in plastic plastic wrap. So what this does is the sponge is still a little warm and that heat is going to want to evaporate and it's going to hit the plastic wrap and it won't be able to get out and then it's going to turn into steam and it's going to make actually the cake on the edges nice and moist. Yeah. So wrap the cake when it's still a little bit warm. And also remember the trick, stick that cake in the refrigerator overnight and then it will 
it will not be dry. I guarantee you. Okay. Thank you, Chef. So next question comes from Helena. Um, so when decorating, since there's a cake board beneath the sponge, how tall should a piped border be to ensure it is included in a slice when serving? So more about the measurement of your piped border on the bottom of the cake since you have a cake board. There's, there's really no rule, you know. You are, it's really up to you. Uh, difficult to enter because uh, there's so many different borders uh, out there. Um, the only answer I have right now is like there's no specific rule, okay? Because uh, you might have sponge cakes that are three, uh, three inches tall, four inches tall. I would say go at least half halfway up with your border, uh, with your decoration, not just the border, but your decorations, and, and that should do it. All right. So we have a question here that seems to be more savory than sweet, but let's uh, try it out. So, hi, chefs. How to build a balanced recipe? Is there any basic ratio rule for building a balanced recipe? You know, it's a, it's a tough so, question to ask because I don't think there's a specific absolutely. ratio. There is one? Absolutely. Okay, go this, for it, chef. We, we, have, we have ratios for everything, and this is this is what makes pastry so so beautiful is that uh, we measure everything uh, if you are uh, if you just break down the recipes in our course and you just put them in percentage of fat percentage of sugar and flour and such you'll have the ratios right there we we all our recipes we've been using them for 40 plus years and uh, those recipes have been actually Affected by the times because when I started baking, you were not born, Chef Scott yet. You're probably a young, young boy. And uh, uh, the sponge cakes were much sweeter and much fattier, okay, and much more flour, okay. And uh, with time, uh, people wanted less fatty cakes, they wanted less sugar, and so on. So those ratios have, uh, have changed a little bit. Uh, just like for for a mousse cake, any kind of mousse cake, we try to keep the uh, sweetness, the sugar, the total sugar content at eighteen percent. So you can so ratios are ab absolutely crucial. Yeah, to to if you don't have if you don't have a system of ratio, you just you just don't know what you're doing. You are actually uh, blind and you're walking in the dark woods. Okay, you just don't know what's going, what you're gonna find, uh, and and that's why we measure everything: the amount of um, the amount of of solids, the amount of fat, uh, the amount of sugar, liquids, and, and so on. And um, in ice cream making, it's the same thing. It gets even much more complicated. But we are all about ratio, and that's why I I always say that. Hot food is much more uh, complicated than pastry because this in hot food you guys are you guys are things that you cannot control the quality of fish the quality of meat and so on and things change when you cook them when you braise them for us we have we we work with a lot of powders nut powder chocolate sugar we can freeze uh, pretty much everything. And so for us, it's more like working as a chemist. And for you guys, it's you got to use your senses, I believe, much more than than a pastry chef. So bravo. So yeah, thanks for the answer to that question. Um, balanced recipe. Uh, pastry recipes all have ratios. When I was learning to cook, um, I carried a little black book around in the kitchen, in a French kitchen, and uh, took ratios down for making stocks, uh, making sauces, um, all sorts of things. But definitely with uh, baked goods, everything's about ratios. All right, so Everything. next question from Colette. This is, uh, what brand of Dutch process cocoa powder do you recommend? Uh, good question. We recommend uh, guitar. Uh, it's um, it's really incredible. Um, we get it in uh, in a big bigger bucket, 
but you don't have to get this big bucket, okay? Uh, and it's called Coco Rouge, okay? So it's really, really intense, has a wonderful flavor, but also also wonderful color. Uh, sometimes you buy cocoa powder out there, and it's like um, grayish, and it, it should not be grayish. There's no reason why it, it would be grayish, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, chocolate is not grayish. Chocolate is is uh, actually uh, dark and uh, and also has reddish tones. So that's why cocoa powder is like this. So so that's the one we recommend. And uh, it's really worth um, the investment because uh, a little bit of this goes a long way. If you buy a cocoa powder that is uh, grayish, that means some fillers have been put in there. It could be sugar, could be cornstarch, God knows what is in there. Uh, to make it cheaper, right? And then you're going to use it and you're going to say, oh, my chocolate cake uh, it doesn't really taste a lot of chocolate. Yeah, that's because um, uh, uh, the, the cocoa powder is not really 100% cocoa powder. Okay? Thank you, Chef. Um, no problem. A question here from uh, Tasneem. Do uh, all the different ways to make the cake make it taste different? And at what time should I decide to go for one technique rather than another? So kind of like, should I use a hot process, a cold process, the white cake? Um, the flavor will be different based on uh, the ratios of the different cakes, but when would you decide to make a cold process versus a hot process, I guess is the question. It, it's really up to you. The, the, the hot process is more like for stability. Yeah. If you make a bigger batch, often uh, they, they, it's going to be more stable. Imagine if you have a big mixer like this of cold process, a sponge cake, it's not as sturdy, so it might collapse, it might deflate quicker, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's one thing to make five eggs of, uh, 10 eggs of sponge cake, it's another thing to make 50 or 100 eggs. And uh, and once once it deflates, unfortunately, there's no reset button. So, so hot process for more stability and cold process uh, for convenience, but you can we can use either or. It's not. It will not affect the taste, the 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 hot or cold process. Okay, excellent. Um, another question here from Carolyn. Um, when using melted chocolate instead of cocoa, are are the amounts the same? So I know the recipe for the chocolate cake has you know forty grams of cocoa powder. If you were to substitute out melted chocolate, would it be the same? Absolutely. You can you can use the same and then see how how you taste, but like it. Uh, and and that from there, you can increase it a little bit if you want to. But uh, mm -hmm. I would start with the same ratio and then go from there. And always use a, a chocolate that is high in cocoa, at least 61% mm -hmm. uh, or 70% or 80%. And what this right. means is uh, the percentage is, uh, is the to to total cocoa content. So here you see 61%. This means... Uh, at least 32% of cocoa butter, and then uh, uh, the, the 29. My math is um, is uh, shaky. 29% of cocoa solids. Yeah, which is cocoa solid is pretty much those uh, those items, the cocoa solids that are crushed into a, a machine called a conch. Okay. So a 61% chocolate uh, contains 61% cocoa solids combined, and the rest is sugar, okay? So that's 39% sugar. Now, the higher the number in your chocolate, if you have an 80% chocolate, then you have only 20% sugar. And you can also use 100% chocolate. It's also called Baker's chocolate. We call it cocoa paste in, in the professional world. So that's no sugar added. And then uh, you can, uh, let's say, uh, what did we say, 40 gram, I believe we said in this example. You could try with 40 grams of 61% uh, of, uh, chocolate. And if it's not strong enough, why not use 40 grams of uh, Baker's chocolate, 100% cocoa, yeah? And then for sure you'll get a different flavor, okay? Yes.
Yes. So we lost Chef Scott. I think he went to the beach, but that's okay. I can. Uh, he he's based in Hawaii. I will do the same thing. Uh, the question is, uh, how do we incorporate um, the melted clarified butter with a little bit of the foam? We do it. I like to do it with a whisk, but I go very very gentle, very very gentle. Okay. Don't. There's no reason to to beat it. Okay. Uh, so that's what I do. You could use a spatula too, but I like this because it's more efficient. And in professional baking, we're always trying to find a method that is the most efficient. Thank you, Chef. I'm back from the beach. So next question oh, you're back. comes oh, from wow. yeah. Next question comes from Jenna. Um, how do you weigh clarified butter? Is there an easy way to know how much clarified butter is yielded from, say, eight ounces of solid butter? So I would say you're weighing the clarified butter after the fact. And I would say that yes. probably 20 to 25% of the butter will be um, the milk solids and the salt that you'll take off. Would you agree, Chef? Yeah. I mean, uh, <clears throat> the butter we use is 82% uh, 82% uh, fat. And then uh, out of those, out of this uh, 82% uh, fat, we have 8.4% of solids. And then the rest is water. Okay. So I'll let you calculate this, uh, but uh, the you lose about about twenty percent uh, of um, so, uh, between the solids and the water. Okay, so the way we do clarified butter, if you need one hundred gram of of clarified butter, why not you scale one hundred twenty five grams of regular butter, and then uh, cook it slowly on the stove. You will hear it crackling. And that crackling is the water in the butter that is hitting the bottom of the pan. Yeah. Stir, keep on stirring uh, slowly. And then eventually the crackling will stop, which means the water, all the water has evaporated. Okay. And then very, very slowly you will uh, skim off the, um, the solids that will rise to the top. And there's some other solids that will be stuck on the bottom of the pan that you will uh, not uh, use. So slowly, whenever you are, you're finally scaling your butter, your clarified butter, you just pour it slowly. So those um, solids that are on the bottom, they don't, they don't come with it. Here's a, here's a trick of the trade that I used to do in the, uh, in the restaurant, the clarified butter. Um, I would clarify it and then I would, refrigerate that in the container so that all the milk solids are on the bottom and then the next day just take out the the fat and discard the liquid so very good trick uh, very good trick next question is uh from from colette colette's in the course and she said chef the temperature of the genoa recipe on the course is 320 degrees she just made it this weekend so you uh did say 350 is 350 better or why would we have 320 on the Which recipe is the that course What's that? Which recipe is 320? I'm looking at the, the hot process. Um, says preheat the oven to 320. Oh, yeah? Hmm. Uh, I will have to look into that. I, I, I look actually checked my notes before. So okay. I will, I will double should... check and then uh, I will, I will uh, if there is uh, something we need to adjust, we'll adjust it. Okay? All right. Thanks for putting that out, Colette. Uh, next question is from uh, Sue. So yes, uh, following on from the previous question, what are the advantages of each method, hot and cold? So if you were to choose um, which one, why would you choose the hot versus the cold? Is it for the ease of it or just personal preference? So yeah, we answered we answered that before. Uh, the hot process is more stable, so it's yep. more uh, uh, it won't collapse as quickly, and then the cold process is easier for production. Okay. So a couple more questions here. Marcel has a question about, are there shirts or totes with our school logo we can buy? Um, we don't have those on hand to buy, but that's a great idea. Um, another question from Lynn. Lynn, I think we answered your question, but what ratio did we replace the dark chocolate for the cocoa powder? And you noted chef to do a one for one, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. One for one and, and, and start with a, a 60 or 70% chocolate and then work all the way up to 100% chocolate if needed. Okay. 
A uh, question from Sheila again. Is your Genoa, uh, if your Genoa is dry, could you use an, an, an imbibing service or a syrup? I'm not sure the imbibing syrup. Oh, uh, uh, that's that's French. IBB <clears throat> is a French. That's your French lesson for the day. I have not given you any homework uh, for this no. one. But IBB in French means to soak something with a liquid. So yes, any any sponge that is a little dry, uh, you can um, you can soak it with. Uh, I would not use simple syrup. Simple syrup is a. Uh, contains 60% uh, sugar, 40% water. It's a little sweet. But what you can do is maybe a 50-50 uh, syrup. And then you can also flavor those syrups. That's wonderful uh, with uh, alcohol. It's always mm -hmm. welcome, right? And But even fruit juices, like clear juices that you, that you uh, uh, incorporate in there. So imagine you make a, a cake and, and you have a mousse or a buttercream. That, that has some, uh, let's say, lemon, and then you put some pieces of uh, mangoes, and then in the, in, the, in the soaking syrup, you put also uh, or some liquor or some juices that are tropical, okay? And, uh, so definitely you can uh, ambibe the sponge, uh, Chef Scott. Thanks, I like the lesson. So a question here uh, about eggless. So hi, chef. What is the substitute for egg and sponges for making eggless cake? That that would be a a, a, a question for Chef uh, Fran. Uh, okay. Uh, chef Fran, uh, who is uh, our specialist in in this uh, in this topic, will uh, will send you an email uh, because it's unfortunately I don't have. Um, I get that question often and I don't have one answer because every single recipe is different. And I cannot say replace eggs with this, some products that I call egg replacers, but it's not as, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> right. And uh, because an egg is full of water, there's fat in there, there's solids, there's, there's an emuls natural emulsifier called lecithin. So uh, Chef Fran, uh, will be yep. more able to answer this question, I'm sure. I've taken your name down and I'll get back to you. So the last question is from Aldo. We have, uh, can I use any of the sponge recipes to make cake rolls? Where I live, people like mango roll cake a lot. So absolutely, I would say absolutely. Yeah, we mentioned that before. Uh, we mentioned that before. Uh, I would scale um, about 600 grams of, of the sponge mix into mm -hmm. uh, a half sheet pan. And when you do that, you need to increase the temperature in your oven. Uh, it makes a lot of sense because now your sponge is about half an inch thick. You cannot bake this at 350 or 325, right? Because what it will take uh, at this temperature will take 20 minutes to bake. And uh, when it comes out of the oven, all the moisture in the sponge is gone and then you have a brick. Uh, so what you need to do, you need to bake it at, let's say 375. You need to bake it quick and fast. So that will take anywhere between nine and 11 minutes, depending on the oven. And then, uh, and then it comes out. As soon as it comes out, let it cool a little bit and then wrap it in plastic wrap and stick it in the refrigerator, okay? And then you can make those rolls. So I think Chef Scott now left uh, left for sure because maybe uh, you know he didn't like the last answer, but uh, that's okay. Uh, you know we here and there we have some uh, technical problems, which is which is normal. It's part of the the whole process. But um, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, their input. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Continue to ask questions. Continue to learn, and uh, we'll always be there to give you all the answers. Thank you very much.